Welcome everybody to, I think this is, it's number six, it's number three in the second series, that's what it is. The second series was more focused on general aviation type things and I wanted to go after some really fun stuff. So the third part of the second series is all about experimental aircraft adventures, which just means I have carte blanche to present whatever I think is the most interesting stuff, which is why it says this lecture is a self-serving exploration of projects. Um, I, you have to start, if you're going to talk about experimental aircraft, you just, you have to start with the uh, Bell X-1, mostly because this launches the modern era of experimental planes where we put large amounts of institutional type dollars into exploring the envelope of what flight can have, what aviation can look like. Previous to this, even though government contracts would go out or Department of Defense would release a RFP to some specifications, an individual company could design and develop a particular airframe and test it and then be able to move forward. From this point forward, from the X1 forward, some of the things that get designed and tested, they just cost so much money that you'd be breaking the bank of most corporations or independent shops or anything to explore those flight regimes and those technologies. So this is a watershed event and it's also just darn cool. Although I'm gonna focus more on odd vehicles rather than famous vehicles in this particular lecture. A couple things you'll wanna note about the X-1. It has an interesting shape. It looks like a particular object, which it actually was designed around. And also, you'll notice I'll discuss the stable later feature. This looks like an elevator, but it's not. There's a traditional rudder on here, but the elevator is non-traditional. Who doesn't want to see this thing in action? So the sound barrier traditionally was thought to be a huge regime, a flight regime that was impenetrable. People didn't think, you know, in, in popular culture, people thought, oh, there's no way we'll ever break the sound barrier. So what was the X-1 designed after? Well, right here, a nice 50 caliber bullet. So for sure people knew beforehand that objects could go faster than the speed of sound that wasn't the problem and the kind of pop culture mythos that we couldn't get an aircraft to go faster than the speed of sound was really from the scientific perspective and the engineering perspective they're just like it's just a challenge we'll get there eventually one thing that's really cool to note is that these pictures right here where you see the shock waves. Most people have seen a picture like this. This just shows how far back we really were thinking about breaking the sound barrier. These pictures are called Schlieren images. And what they do is shine fairly collimated light through the fluid. And where there's a shock wave, the properties of the fluid change and the refractive index of the fluid changes. So that means the amount of light that penetrates through the fluid gets changed. So it allows you to see the invisible. You're looking at the actual shock waves, which if you just were seeing the object, you wouldn't be able to see it. And I brought this image up because these images reveal very interesting properties about objects that are going through fluids at greater than the speed of sound. You'll see this initial cone, the initial shock wave, and comes from the very tip of the object. You'll notice also though, that in this straight wing design, look at how many other shock waves are coming off of this wing itself. So a straight wing design, even though the X1 had it, is not the most stable configuration. Now we go backwards. So Here's the latest, fastest machine until the X-1, or a few other aircraft actually approached these Mach numbers after the war. But this guy, Alexander Lipich, was seminal in coming up with many, many, many aspects about high-speed flight. And he's one of the design engineers for the famous Mischer-Smith 163 
Comet. Let's look at this vehicle a little bit. So one of the problems with supersonic flight is the elevator. Traditional elevators are solid objects that stick off the tail and then have movable surfaces at the rear of it, much like a rudder. You can see here, this is a solid rudder piece with a movable rudder. And the problem though, not with the rudder, but with the elevator is when the angle of attack changes and you're near supersonic flight, you get actual turbulent zones behind the wing or the rudder. And if your control surface is trying to act on turbulent air, you don't get any kind of forces, you get actual instability. So traditional rudders did not work on high-speed vehicles. Lippich solved that problem with the ME-163 by actually ditching the elevator altogether and going with elevons. So these are ailerons and elevators all at the same time. So he completely avoided that near supersonic problem of turbulent surfaces, especially for the control, by deleting them completely. And look, he's already got swept wings and a bullet-like shape. We're gonna continue on with Lippisch because this guy's really cool. He's one of the German scientists that after the war, the United States and Russia plowed through Germany and sucked up all the talent, and Lippisch is one of them. This is Movie Town. David Jacobs reporting. At Cedar Rapids, Iowa, a wingless flying bus called the Aerodyne is given a trial trip. Invented by Dr. Lippisch, the strange contraption is sponsored by the American Navy in the hope that it may eventually lead to important developments. An internal lift-inducing propulsion system is coupled with fans that draw air through the front and expel it past louvers underneath. Tilt the louvers backward and the bus goes forward and vice versa. No doubt you guessed it was something like that. So this guy, he was kind of scary looking, yeah? But this guy's like flying around drones inside a warehouse uh, half a century ago. How cool is that? So this is his creation that I find so interesting. It's one of the strangest, strangest vehicles in the experimental aircraft uh, regime. It's called the Aerodyne and it's a VTOL aircraft. And it's one of the first kind of effective designs that didn't launch from a vertical orientation. Uh, I'll show something that describes the vertical orientation in, a, in the next slide. You'll notice that this is kind of like a, it's a very interesting hybrid. So he's got a ducted fan here, but the, the ducted fan is so large, this is almost like an annular wing, right? So an annular wing is a wing that's in some kind of circular configuration. And he's got a large ducted fan that blows out with control louvers and then kind of a traditional tail so he got funding to create a full-size prototype that was tested in NASA's wind tunnels, but uh, he didn't end up having any kind of success after that. Lipich actually um, quit and went in, he, he contracted, he had cancer, so he stopped research for in the late 60s. So, Previous to this, a lot of the attempts at doing VTOL had uh, the vertical configuration. On November 2nd, 1954, Skeets Coleman took the Pogo skyward on its first transition flight. Because the Pogo took off and landed on its tail, Coleman needed to carry out both outbound and inbound transitions in one flight. As Coleman eased the stick forward, the Pogo's nose slowly bowed toward the horizon. As propeller lift was replaced with wing lift, the Allison engine pulled the plane forward at a surprising rate. Because V-stall planes require less power to fly forward than they do to hover, Coleman eased back on the throttle 
as he darted across the Southern California sky. As Coleman pulled back on the stick, he simply performed an aerodynamic reversal of his forward transition. As the plane lifted skyward, wing lift was maintained by the propeller slipstream. Once achieving a hover, Coleman simply reduced power and the pogo descended back to earth. It was the first flight in which a pilot flew both aerodynamically and in the hover. For his achievement, James Skeets Coleman was awarded the Harmon Trophy. I find the pogo vehicle fascinating because it worked out so well and, and the transitional flight regime was done so well. And that was by a human. There was no stability computers back then to, uh, to a system like in an Osprey today. I mean, it's computers that are taking care of all of this kind of transitional flight regimes. But this is half a century ago. And you can imagine this looks like, oh, it's going to be fantastic technology. It should be ready to go. And yet still it took until, you know, the late nineties before, um, anyone got effective vehicles that were getting close to something that we could put into service. And the other thing that I think is interesting about this is like, okay, does, does his cockpit chair rotate or does he have to climb in and strap himself down by staring at the sky? So that's, that's going to be a little bit of a operational snafu if you had to put one of these into service. So Lippish design actually uh, got a second life. This is his original patented figures from 1956. I find these fascinating because, so he'd already been an engineer in the top of the profession for many years. And yet he's sketching out these very kind of simplistic, interesting designs and labeling with ornate figure one and figure two letterings, which is pretty interesting. I'm not sure if he had a drafts person do that or he did it himself. Um, the German government investigated his machine and had Dornier aircraft produce a prototype which actually flew. And that's just about the weirdest looking flying contraption you could come up with, yeah. It's very, very uh, fascinating. Of course, you can imagine that it's got a lot of stability issues and, uh, you know, usefulness. All right, now I'll go back in time again to another fascinating aircraft, which this always, as a kid reading about World War II aviation history, which is probably the top on my list, um, I always thought this thing was just crazy. Like, how did it stay stable or was it always in side slip as it's flying um but the vv 141 was designed simply to allow for the maximum visibility from the cockpit so basically trying to get a configuration where the highest amount of visibility is available to both the pilot and the observer and then the rear gunner so this aircraft, the Blumen Voss design engineers decided, okay, we'll just put the cockpit over to the side. We don't need an engine in the cockpit. Let's just make the whole thing glass. Unfortunately, or fortunately, they only built 28 of them. And because there was not a huge supply of uh, particular engines, they were not able to prove its worth and other aircraft, more traditional styles went into mass production. But, so the one that you just saw was the BV-141B. I couldn't find any video of that, but I did find a small snippet for the original BV-141A.
Major Martin, how did they account for the extra weight on the wing then? Right, so it's balanced in lateral gravity correctly, but to me, the problem is it, and I even, when you're watching this, it almost does look like it's always in slightly a side slip. Here, I'll, I'll play again, it's only 30 seconds. It almost always looks like it's in a slight side slip, um, you know, flight. Like, it just seems that the one port wing is always a slightly ahead and it's slide slipping slightly. Uh, it's crazy. Looks like they offset it also with the asymmetric horizontal stabilizer. Yeah, so the 141B went with the completely asymmetric uh, stabilizer as well. Anyhow, I find that one fascinating. It's, in terms of experimental aircraft, that's to to get 28 examples and actually flying. That's that's a that's a pretty cool feat, as odd as it is. Okay, now we move on to uh, another uh, one. Of, actually, probably one of the most famous experimental aircraft designers, perhaps ever. So, Bert Rutan is a aircraft engineer who has created a number of fascinating projects. We won't go through all of them. To go through all of Rutan Aviation's projects would take uh, three or four lectures alone, and, and that would be fun. But one thing I found out about him that I did not know is that, surprise, surprise, um, and no, I did, when I set out to do this particular lecture, I didn't want to focus on VTOL at all, really didn't have much to do with it. And then it turns out that all of these famous guys were all working on VTOL projects. So he had his start working for the Air Force developing VTOL aircraft. And specifically, he had worked on this, the Ling Tenko Vought XC-142. So this is kind of the precursor technology to the Osprey. When, they, when these uh, rotational wing aircraft, the transitional flight regime aircraft came out, originally for stability's sake, they would rotate the whole wing. Because you can imagine that if you've got forced air movement across the wing, then you have control surfaces which allow you to maintain stable control. Whereas the Osprey just rotates the engines, but the Osprey does it because they have efficient control over very large um, rotors. So propellers don't allow you to modulate the thrust as effectively as large rotors. So, this one was a surprise to me, and I was able to find a nice little snippet. So you can imagine going from the Pogo, where the whole vehicle had to transition flight, to now we go to a vehicle that the wing rotation is the transitional flight. The airplane that man has dreamed about for many decades has become a reality. The XC-142A can do many things. For one, with wings at a 45 degree angle, it takes off within 50 feet, gains altitude, and then tilts wings and motors to the horizontal for speeds of better than 400 miles an hour. Then, if confined to a small space, it can take off or land on a tennis court as a small propeller on its tail maintains stability. This remarkable aircraft can carry 32 combat-ready troops and set them down right at the battlefront. The plane's capabilities, both military and civilian, are almost limitless. Midtown air terminals, rescue missions, explorations. The new plane will be able to go where angels fear to tread. So I find that really, really fun because that's 1965 and he's touting the uh, amazing capabilities and how wonderful this thing's going to be and how great it was. And, and no, they had so many problems <laughs> in getting to be something more than an experimental aircraft that you don't get to something that has this kind of capability that's effective in flight until you get to the Osprey program, which was followed. I mean, even as an experimental aircraft, the Osprey program doesn't come in until 25 years after this, I think. 
that's a very interesting snippet in history. This is the capability that everybody wanted at that point in time, short takeoff landing or actual vertical takeoff and landing with, uh, you know, multi-squad capability or a single vehicle, you know, movement capability, but um, it wasn't a reality for many moons. Okay, so that was what Rutan worked on for the Air Force, but when he left the Air Force and started his own company, uh, before he even really got heavily into producing aircraft designs or, or uh, producing aircraft for other people, he built his own kit aircraft and was called the Very Vigan. Um, he modeled it after the Saab Vigan, which is a interceptor fighter that uses canards, which is pretty cool. So one of the things that you'll notice about almost all of Rutan's designs when they come out of his scaled composites company or they're designed as kits is he, he leans heavily on the canard design. And we'll talk about that uh, in a minute. But this aircraft right here, literally he just released the plans and sold them. So people had to build this very vegan by sourcing all their own materials and following his designs. And a number of these were actually built, so it's pretty interesting. And you can see that the evolution of this design is already happening for him. He's got a pusher configuration, it's swept wings, single canard up front, and you'll see that there's not a single rudder, obviously, because it's pusher configuration. He's got two rudders and winglets out on the outboards of the wings. As this design evolves, you'll watch these rudders move outboard and a few other features. But in a, as a basic concept, this is a really effective aircraft. So why canards? The first and foremost reason for using canards is just simply efficiency. The efficiency comes into play in more than one way. So if I tell you the two main ways, you'll be convinced right away that, yep, using canards beats the heck out of using an elevator. One, an elevator, so an aircraft has to have its center of gravity somewhere near its center of lift. And for a stable flight, you kind of want your center of gravity to be slightly in front of your center of lift so that if you do have to glide, you don't have unstable aircraft. Now that's not particularly the, the main problem in these days because, you know, like a, like a jet airline or something, they move the weight around in a number of ways. But for us, like with our 182s and stuff, we, you know, we have to keep track of where on the airframe the, the uh, payload is placed so that we keep our weight and balance correct. You'll notice that in a traditional sense, the center of gravity is ahead of the center of lift, meaning that the elevator is actually pulling the aircraft, pitching it up slightly, continuously. So you're actually wasting a little bit of efficiency keeping the plane in nice level flight. Now this is a stability bonus, but it's an efficiency hit because that amount of force is burnt up as drag. And it also means that you need to have a larger control surface because you have to counteract the weight. Whereas a canard, in terms of the control surface, you can now shrink it and you're actually allowing the canard to provide a portion of the lift so you can balance out the efficiency and keep the drag down. So there's no necessary um, counteracting force with the canard configuration. So you think, all right, there's two great reasons why we should all fly aircraft with canards. And those are correct. There's other reasons why the canard configurations is very, very good too. But there's a couple of reasons why most aircraft don't have canards. And that is basically 
safety flight regimes and being able to maintain stability in extreme um, attitudes. So with this little image here, I can demonstrate quickly what the problem is. You're using this canard as a control surface, means that either the whole canard tilts up and down to pitch the aircraft up and down, or you've got traditional control surfaces at the back of the canard which pitch up and down. Now, if the angle of attack increases and you're starting to approach uh, stall conditions, you're gonna lose control authority with the canard and you can imagine the canard must stall first in order for the aircraft to reorient itself in a stable flight regime. This is why we have um, in, our, in our planes a tail surface. It doesn't, <coughs> it doesn't matter if the elevator stalls or not. When the wing stalls and the center of gravity is forward of the lift, the aircraft automatically pitches down and returns to quote unquote safe level flight, hopefully. If the main wing stalls in a configuration with a canard setup, you can imagine that the canard is still providing lift, the main wing is losing lift, the plane actually will now pitch up, which then exacerbates the problem in a, in a you know, stall setting. So you do have to have very, um, good designs and controlled flight regimes that don't allow the canard to uh, stall after the main wing stall. So that's one of the main reasons that all aircraft aren't canard aircraft. <clears throat> it's you have to have specific design envelopes and you cannot exceed those as a safety feature. And also these are actually really quite safe aircraft, but they can't be treated like uh, 182 where you know almost anything you do in a Cessna 72 or 82 all of the things that are built into that product are designed to make it as safe as possible like a canard doesn't a canard type aircraft doesn't need as much washout because you're not going to tip stall the main wings they're all the way in the back you're going to tip stall the or, or turn stall the canard which automatically corrects that. So it's more efficient, but the, the Cessna automatically then corrects itself, you know, whereas this type of aircraft won't automatically correct itself. It's not gonna turn to nice level flight regime automatically unless you're on top of it. So many of these were built the, of this version, the long ease. So this is, Basically, Rutan's design that took his very Vigan or his concept aircraft for small personal aircraft as the most efficient plane and pushed it to a very, very um, efficient, fast, stable, uh, well loved aircraft, really good design. This particular one is actually a NOAA aircraft, which was used for doing. Uh, instrument data collection. You can see there's a whole package out front. Probably they've got like a mini Doppler radar and some atmospheric aerosol pumps or a bunch of different things, packages on this flying around. So you can see that in his kind of more uh, stabilized configuration for this type of aircraft, the rudders are all the way out board. Um, long, slim, thick, sleek design, designed for a certain uh, envelope, speed envelope, and designed for efficiency. So there's a two-seat <coughs> aircraft that has very, very high efficiency. Um, it has a pretty good safety history, especially considering 700 uh, production run, or I don't, not production run, most of these are experimental, but, um, 700 registered airframes in the US. Um, there are a few uh, accident history reports. One of them, unfortunately, is a famous accident, and that was when um, John Denver ditched his 
and died. But unfortunately, that was predominantly pilot error and had little to do with the airframe itself. So we can see that the design is quite specific and more refined than his first very Vigan. Look at some of the specs on this though. This is fantastic. 2,000 mile range with the 27,000 foot service ceiling, crazy rate of climb, cruise speed of a 125 knots. So this is pretty good performance style aircraft. You know, it's not like a high performance aircraft, but you imagine being able to do 100 and I mean, a 1,700 nautical mile trip. I mean, you can fly from state to state to state in this thing in comfort, pretty cool. I was turned on to this stuff completely sold over when I was, I think, 13 years old. My grandfather in Palmer, Alaska, when we went to an air show, and there was a, uh, I don't think it was a long ease then, it was a quickie, but the same type of configuration, only a single seat there. And I was just fascinated, stood there and stared at that thing for probably 20 minutes, kind of like, wow, how does that thing even work? It's an amazing aircraft. And to give you an idea of how cool these are, we can take a short flight with someone. can kind of get a feel too just you know from handheld camera I mean they're obviously not flying on a day when there's tons of turbulence and stuff but the uh, the smoothness of the canard configuration is definitely apparent like the pitching motions are damped out with this configuration instead of kind of more oscillatory from a tail type design pretty cool I love that thing. I'd like to have one someday. All right, so the other aircraft that Rutan designed, which kind of was completely earth shattering, uh, is called the Rutan Voyager. So this aircraft is like basically the extreme in trying to produce something efficient. It's again, a canard design. In essence, it's a flying fuel tank. It's how to get a fuel tank in a shape that will stay up in the air as long as possible. In the process of designing this and testing it, they broke a record flying it for seven days. And that broke a record that had been held since the 30s when a diesel powered plane had flown for I think three days, something like that. I forget the numbers exactly. So, and they just were testing it, flying around in these big circuits around um, California. This uh, fuselage allows for two pilots. Obviously, you've got to take a break. There's two engines. One of the engines is basically there just to help get it up into the air. And then they feather that and run the pusher engine. 
in an efficient cruise mode. The coolest part is that they were successful, 1986. It was Dick Rutan and Jana Yeager who flew this thing for nine days and circumnavigated the globe. Now, this is a view from inside the cockpit and you can see that you're basically sitting on the floor and you don't have a lot of forward, there's no forward view. You're always looking off to the side and you're, you're basically squashed in with another person in a small tube where you can't even completely sit up straight. And they did that for nine days. What's really scary is that, and we'll see in the next little clip, uh, this is the actual takeoff run. There was like 3,000 journalists at the takeoff ceremony. And during the ceremony, I mean, during the takeoff, they had never actually fully loaded the plane up. It, it was, in all the testing, they didn't load it completely. And you can watch as it goes down the runway that literally the wingtips are actually dragging on the ground. And you see that it has its little winglets at the end, the little winglets pointing up to prevent and to kind of, you know, reduce the amount of uh, vortical drag. They were afraid that its takeoff roll was gonna be so long that it wouldn't actually get into the air, but the wings finally, at some point, configure to flight and it takes off. Barely. The wing tips dragged for so long that it burned right through the carbon fiber and into the foam. And there was a chase plane that went up alongside it to check the damage. They determined that none of the actual really flight characteristics were gonna be impacted except for the fact that now, because it had burned through that little bottom section and that was part of the carbon fiber that held on the winglet, that the winglets were actually flopping. And so Dick Rutan, who was the pilot when he took it off, side slipped the, that plane for a little while on both sides to flop the winglets enough so they fell off. So you'll see in that previous picture here, you'll see that the wing tips are damaged and there's no winglets. <laughs> They've already flopped them off. Yeah, so that was the takeoff roll and they flew that thing for nine days. So the other part that was really harrowing and they said was highly stressful about the, that particular flight was because it was so overloaded that it actually did not have very good uh, flight characteristics. And Dick Rutan basically flew that aircraft for three days straight because he couldn't get out of the cockpit seat to switch with Jenna. So it, the minute he would try and put it in cruise or something to swap out, it would start to lose its, uh, you know, its control authority. So they really went through quite an ordeal, but it's amazing, amazing aircraft from an amazing guy. And finally, we'll go back to one of the, another crazy aircraft. This will be the, the last one. This one just, this always, I found this thing super fascinating, not just for what it is, but, and you guys can look it up too and, and read about it. This was super Cold War hush hush top secret Air Force design to start with, right? The initial intent was to have some kind of VTOL-like aircraft that could far exceed any capability of like a helicopter, you know, and, and get into the range of like non-supersonic type attack aircraft or, you know, have capabilities like that. And you can see the expected designed parameters are quite interesting. They're looking at 300 miles an hour. They wanted to have 
a thousand mile range, 10,000 foot ceiling. And then at, what's funny is it shows what was achieved in the end. They wanted to go 300 miles an hour and they went 35. They wanted to go <clears throat> a thousand miles and the thing would maybe go 80 miles. I mean, a scooter could go farther and faster. <laughs> they wanted to have a surface ceiling of a thousand feet and the thing never really floated above ground effect, three feet. So, and it was so hush hush that it was top secret for multiple years. I think it was like six or seven years before it was actually, you know, it was probably right around the time when they cancel it, when it becomes non top secret. So this is a, a very, very interesting project and obviously a complete failure, but fascinating that, you know, that type of experimental aircraft received so much effort. And what they were trying to do was exploit this thing called the Kwanda effect, which was discovered by Henri Kwanda. Um, and it's the property of a fluid to want to stay um, attached when it's jetted next to a laminar surface. So this picture didn't render very well, but if you can imagine fluid is coming out from the top here and going down around the side of this um, kind of nozzle cone shaped thing, that if you're pushing jetted fluid out, the Kawanda effect means that that jetted fluid gets pulled down the side, right? And you can imagine that as something goes around a curved surface, it has to travel faster than the fluid that goes on the underside, which means that just like part of what drives lift in an aircraft wing, the same thing happens here. You've got fluid that's moving at a higher rate, which means the pressure is lower, which means the pressure is higher underneath. And so the net force is in the vertical for this. And that's what they were trying to exploit with that Avro car, but having an idea about it and then having it be a functional reality are definitely two different things. And fortunately, in the 50s, we get to the point where we've got some good video to watch these things. So one of the main problems, and we can think about that for just a second before we uh, go for questions, is something that's operating in ground effect requires a different type of control authority. So I don't know if any of you are familiar with hovercraft. This thing, in essence, acted like a hovercraft, but without the stability of a hovercraft, a hovercraft then has skirts that come down around the outside edge and internal baffling inside that takes the pressure distribution of the air and moves it around underneath so that it's more evenly distributed. Whereas if you have something like this, you can imagine if it tilts one way, you've got an uneven pressure distribution 
it tilts another way, you've got an uneven, and there's no way for it to automatically balance itself out. So all of the uh, veins and all of the controls to keep the thing stable just waste a massive amount of energy, even when you're down in ground effect, where you'd think that you'd have a stability assist by the higher pressure zones. It turns out that it actually makes it unstable. So the same thing, not having enough power and lift to actually get it up into the air, and not having the control, control authority when it's in ground effect mean that basically this is a $10 million hovercraft that doesn't even work. So pretty interesting stuff. All right, so that concludes the presentation portion.